Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Zero Trust in Action. My name is Leonard Volling. I'm the Microsoft Alliance Director at Critical Start, a managed detection and response company. We're joined today by Apex Digital Solutions, a Microsoft Gold partner focused on helping customers solve problems with Microsoft productivity and security solutions. Joining me for today's webinar is Sean Flahey and Tommy Scott. Sean Flahey is a senior Microsoft practice director at Apex. He has over 11 years experience designing and deploying Microsoft Cloud and security solutions. Sean has also completed multiple security certifications, including CISSP, MS500, and AZ500. Tommy Scott is a senior security consultant at Critical Start, where he helps customers explore Critical Start's MDR services. Tommy has spent a decade in the information security industry with experience ranging from security operations, security engineering, uh, GRC, within industries such as healthcare, retail, and oil and gas. Uh, we're going to have two key focus areas uh, for today's webinar. Uh, first, we're going to start talking about how to apply zero trust as it relates to the control side of the house. And then we're going to, with the second half of the webinar, get into how we can apply zero trust as it relates to detection response. Uh, to start things off, I'm going to hand it to Sean to talk through some of the control concepts. Sean, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Leonard. Um, so a question I get asked a lot by customers is, you know, we hear the zero trust term a lot and they want to know what does it really mean and, and how do I deploy it and, and, and how do we get started? And, um, you know, zero trust uh, isn't necessarily a product. Um, I would call it more of a security framework. And to get a little bit more details is it's, it's a security framework uh, that requires all users, regardless of where, uh, where they're located, uh, what device they're using, to be authenticated and authorized and continuously validated before being granted access to an application or to data. And so we think about today, um, you know, a traditional security model may have been a what we call perimeter based model, meaning, you know, everyone is all the employees are in the office or in multiple offices. And as long as we have, uh, you know, protection at the perimeter, like a firewall or security devices that live, uh, you know, on the edge of a network. And as long as the employees and the, the applications, data and devices are behind that firewall or those security devices, then, you know, everything's trusted. Um, but we all know, especially over the last uh, year and a half, two years, that, um, you know, not everyone, the, not many people are, are in the office anymore. And we've got uh, just a proliferation of, you know, devices, different types of devices. Uh, people are working from uh, anywhere and we still need to offer that same level of protection across the environment. Um, so adopting a different type of model than uh, than the traditional protect the perimeter model um, is what we're going over today and and really what the basis of zero trust is. So a couple benefits of zero trust is it allows organizations to do business quickly and adapt to new work scenarios, especially with remote or hybrid work and working from home. Uh, it allows organizations to ensure that their data and their applications is protected wherever users or devices live. Um, the second one is, uh, you know, candidates and workers that are entering the workforce uh, now are coming to expect that hybrid work is here to stay and you know organizations need to make sure that they have a model that can support this from a security perspective um, and the third thing i want to say is zero trust is a continuous journey um, it's not uh, like tomorrow we're going to show up and say okay we are zero trust now and you know this is this is us um, there are many different pieces uh, that go into a zero trust journey and you know, hopefully what we can get out today is there are some ways to get some quick wins to prove the strategy, to prove this is uh, gonna be a viable security model going forward and then, and then moving from there. So first I wanna talk about uh, three pillars or principles of zero trust um, that we start out with in each zero trust conversation. And the first one is verify explicitly. And what this means is you're always authenticating and authorizing based on all available data points. And the data points may be 
what is the user identity? Where are they located? What's their location? What device are they logging in from? Is it a personal or a corporate owned device? What's the health of that device? Is it, uh, does it have the latest security updates? Does it have the latest operating system? And then other things we're talking about are what type of data are they accessing? You know, are they accessing just uh, normal email or are they accessing sensitive company data or are potentially that is that user an administrator and I, are they administering things for an organization um, and that becomes very important. And then we're also looking for anomalies in those uh, uh, in those logins. So are, are users logging in from uh, from a location here uh, in the US uh, one minute and then a minute later they're logging in from Europe. Uh, that's definitely an anomaly. Uh, so we want to call that out and 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 take action based on those anomalies. Uh, the second one is using least privileged access uh, or limiting user access with just in time or just enough access. Uh, this is especially important with administrator roles. Um, you know, having dedicated accounts for administrators and making sure that Maybe they're they don't have administrator access all the time. Uh, maybe they just need to activate an administrator role uh, when they need to do certain certain things, and then after that, uh, that access goes away. And that's true for regular users as well. Not giving users access to everything in the organization is key, uh, because if that user gets breached, the uh, potential for damage is is slightly smaller. And that's kind of a good segue into the next principle here: is assume breach. And what this means is we are uh, assuming if, assuming we got breached, we're minimizing the black uh, blast radius, so to speak. Um, so if so, if a user gets compromised or uh, data gets compromised, the amount of damage that can be done is limited to a smaller amount. Um, we can do things like prevent lateral movement across uh, networks by segmenting networks. Um, and then last is we're assuming breach and we're always looking for that breach. We're using analytics to gain visibility, um, threat, uh, hunt for threats and, and detect those threats um, before they can really uh, do further damage in an organization. Um, so the, here we have just a, a simple diagram of, of a zero trust security framework. And um, you know we use security policy enforcement as as the heart of this uh, diagram, um, but there's really what we call six zero trust defense areas um, or things that we want to protect within an organization. Uh, the first two are pretty straightforward. We want to protect user identities, and we also want to protect protect devices. Um, down here, um, we, you know we talked uh, last slide about um, networks. Uh, we want to make sure we segment networks and that not uh, not everyone can get access to every piece of a network, especially areas that have uh, sensitive resources. And then the last three defense areas, uh, data, apps, and infrastructure. So if you kind of look at this, uh, if you read this diagram going from left to right, you know we've got identities and devices that they're going to access data, apps, and infrastructure. And obviously the network is the conduit to how they get to these three uh, three things on the right here. Um, so um, with identities, um, just simple things such as uh, using multi multi-factor authentication and measuring user and session risks um, across identities. Devices, what device is the user coming from? Uh, and and you know, a simple thing uh, of, of any security model is device inventory. Do we know all the devices out there that uh, either are either corporate owned or that are have a potential to connect to corporate data? We want to know that and then we want to analyze what those devices are and, and what they're trying to access. And then obviously what we're trying to access here is we're accessing data, apps and infrastructure. Uh, so this slide here, uh, making zero trust a reality. Um, what I, what we figured we we wanted to do was just uh, cover three of those defense areas, and I want to talk a little bit more about just some real world examples on how to get started on your real world, uh, on how to get started on your uh, zero trust journey. And we're going to start with identities. So a couple things to start out with. Um, 
that are fairly basic. And I think uh, if you're not already started on this on this path, uh, this would be a great time to start. Number one is requiring multi-factor authentication and or managed devices for highly privileged admin accounts. Um, and I mentioned this before, but protecting your administrative roles or your administrative accounts within an organization is like protecting the gold um, because if an attacker gets access to an administrative account, um, you know, they have a, a potential to do quite a bit of damage versus just a, a regular user account. The second one um, is requiring multi-factor authentication for VPN access. And, um, you know, it seems simple, but, uh, you know, I've mentioned multi-factor authentication as the, as a key to protecting identities. And what we like to say is we like to protect every door into an organization with multi-factor authentication. And, and what I mean by that is one door, so to speak, is VPN. Um, a second door might be uh, cloud applications like Microsoft Office 365, or uh, maybe you have um, an HR system that is in the cloud. Uh, protecting those applications with multi-factor authentication is definitely an easy step to get started on your uh, zero trust journey. And after you do a couple of those things and you show value and that the user experience isn't necessarily degraded by implementing some of these small steps, this is where you can expand from there. Um, you can really start to gain buy-in from the organization that, hey, security is definitely important uh, for the organization. It's not really impacting user, act user productivity. And then we can continue on our path to zero trust. And then the last one for identity, is uh, start to implement single sign-on for all the applications that it's possible for. Uh, this allows for full visibility, conditional access, and a consistent identity lifecycle. Um, you know, organizations today have tons and tons of cloud apps, and if we have to manage a password policy and multi-factor authentication and user user accounts individually across 10, 20, hundreds of applications that becomes a daunting task but if we can consolidate into an identity management system that allows for consistency across all those cloud applications um, it really allows um, for for a, a better uh, security model and identity model there uh, the second uh, defense area we wanted to cover was infrastructure specifically around legacy apps um, so definitely aware that many organizations have legacy apps that are um, difficult to protect with modern identity models and uh, modern infrastructure and and frankly these legacy apps are still needed to run the business and we understand that they're not just gonna uh, you can't just say okay time to upgrade the app um, because uh, sometimes either it's not possible or it's cost prohibitive and so we just kind of need to make these things work but that being said, um, there are still ways, more modern ways that we can protect these more than what they already have. And specifically is um, uh, the second bullet point there is leveraging a secure gateway to legacy systems. Um, uh, specifically with the Microsoft realm, uh, there's a product called Azure AD uh, Application Proxy. And what this does is it allows you to put Azure AD authentication in front of that legacy application. So, um, you know, all of the great things you get with Azure Active Directory, such as multi-factor authentication, conditional access, and uh, identity monitoring, you can apply those to your legacy apps um, to get better security on those. So definitely recommend uh, looking at uh, tools like that to help you, um, you know, uh, advance your zero trust journey from your legacy applications. The second one there is a least privileged model um, for critical infrastructure, regardless of where it's located. So we understand you still may have infrastructure located in, or I should say infrastructure or servers located on premises in your local data centers, um, but you also may have it at co-locations and also in cloud providers like Microsoft Azure, uh, AWS, Google, wherever it's stored, it's definitely important that um, we use leverage a least privileged model um, so we only give access to 
the users that absolutely need it to to do their daily jobs. And then the last one is uh, an important one, but also sometimes gets forgotten, um, but it's a basic one. Keep up with software and firmware updates on all infrastructure. Um, there's just been too many instances of um, of attacks that uh, are resulted from uh, devices not being updated to the latest software and firmware firmware updates. And then the last uh, defense area I wanted to talk about was uh, your devices or your endpoints. What are you using to connect to data? And I like to start with basics again. Um, so with basics of devices, make sure all devices are encrypted and make sure they require pin policies. Um, and then taking that a step further, um, you can start enforcing compliance on these devices, such as making sure that each device must meet certain standards, whether that's your antivirus standard, uh, specific host based firewall settings or other policies. And then once you have devices with a standard compliance or base uh, or security baseline on those devices you can start saying okay um, to access certain types of data or to access corporate data at all not only do you have to have a legitimate user id uh, and it has to be protected with multi-factor authentication and other things but you can take it a step further and say you could also have to be coming from a corporate owned device and that corporate device has to be meet certain health requirements uh, meaning it has to be up to date on antivirus it has to have uh, an, a host based firewall enabled and so that allows you to take that to the next level so it's not just uh, you're not just validating identity but you're also validating device health as well to access corporate systems and then the last one here is um, consistent monitoring of signals uh, both from an identity standpoint and from a device standpoint. Um, so, you know, we've always had traditional antivirus tools where if, um, you know, if a user downloads uh, a file that's to be a, a known infected file, to be a known piece of malware, uh, traditional, traditional antivirus tools will block those, right? But we all know the more modern attacks, um, antivirus can be uh, moved around and if if an attacker gets on a device and starts um you know maybe running some malicious powershell scripts or moving laterally across the network we need to make sure we have analytics and and uh, monitoring to be able to uh, pick up those device signals and stop those attacks in their tracks so with that i want to transition um here so the goal of my section was to really go over a, at a high level what zero trust is and discuss some easy ways to get started. Um, from here, I definitely want to hand it over to Leonard and Tommy to discuss how we can take those zero trust policies and enable them through their managed detection and response platform or MDR uh, for short. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back over to Leonard. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Sean. And, and yeah, it, it really is. There's there's lots of ground to cover, right? Um, certainly, you got to know what you're protecting and why. Uh, you need to have controls uh, in place, like like Sean went through, and 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 you've got to be able to manage detection response. Uh, and and that's what that's what Critical Start does with our MDR service. So I'll spend uh, you know five or ten minutes just kind of level setting on on some of the MDR concepts and and how we apply zero trust uh, with within our service. And then I'll hand it over to Tommy uh, to close things out uh, with a little deeper dive under the hood and, and with a demo. So, uh, but to, to start, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about uh, the, uh, the kill chain or attack chain. Uh, not not gonna try to educate, you know, anyone here. I assume, you know, everybody has some familiarity uh, with this. Uh, but you know, it helps to think about the, the the journey of an attacker, right? How they enter a, a network today, uh, and it's been the case for for a number of years now. A lot of attacks start with a phishing email, so you have to have signal. Uh, you certainly have to have controls, but you also have to have signal uh, detection signal, you know, security alert signal from uh, that email and collaboration space. Uh, 
exploit installation command and control. That's usually activity that's happening on an endpoint. So obviously we, we need to have coverage there. Uh, and you know, Sean talked about identity. Uh, this is in today's world of, of cloud first and remote work, uh, having identity uh, visibility uh, is critical to our success in uh, detecting and stopping attackers. Uh, beyond identity, you know, identity can take form of, of cloud identity. Identity can be obviously as a part of uh, on-premises Active Directory environment. Um, ultimately, attackers are typically after data. Uh, they're either wanting to deploy ransomware to hold your data hostage or exfiltrate data uh, for, for value maybe on the black market. So, you know, when we think about that attack chain uh, and, and how do we apply zero trust as it relates to detect and response, and we want to have coverage uh, basically end to end uh, is the goal. Um, and so to, to kind of put that in the context of uh, the Microsoft tools available to provide uh, security detection. Uh, Microsoft has Defender for Office 365, uh, which is that email and collaboration based uh, uh, threat protection tool. They have Defender for Endpoints, uh, an Azure Defender for infrastructure and endpoint protection, threat protection. And then when it comes to the identity side, they offer Azure Active Directory Identity Protection, Microsoft Defender for Identity, and, and Microsoft Cloud App Security really becomes, in my opinion, a little bit more of an aggregator. Uh, it is a CASB solution, so it certainly offers threat protection for your SaaS applications. But you know, Microsoft is uniquely positioned to be able to offer this suite of threat protection solutions, whereas as a customer, you can have coverage really, again, end to end. So our, our MDR story builds on this Microsoft story. Uh, and it, it's all brought together uh, in some ways with, with Azure Sentinel. Uh, Azure Sentinel can aggregate from these different threat protection tools. It can also aggregate from traditional third-party tools uh, like Firewall. Um, so that's that's an important piece as well. Uh, a place that, that Critical Start doesn't get into as much, but is, is certainly relevant, uh, is the more the compliance and risk side of the house. Uh, so when we think about data protection, you know, you can definitely go down uh, uh, the path of, okay, well, what does that mean from a, from an insider risk perspective or from a DLP perspective? So showing that for completeness, uh, but really not an area that Critical Start plays with, with our MDR service. But so we've talked about the attack, attack chain in general. Uh, we've talked about the Microsoft tools and I also wanted to talk about Critical Start's MDR offerings and make sure you understand, you know, where where we're able to provide coverage. Uh, we do have an MDR offering focused on the endpoint, so that's something our customers can consume standalone. Uh, we also have an MDR offering focused on the SIM, Azure Sentinel, and again, that's something that can be consumed either individually or in conjunction with the other services. Uh, we also have an offering focused on Microsoft 365 Defender. So with the, the Microsoft 365 Defender offering, uh, we're able to provide coverage like, like Microsoft for that full attack chain. So we're able to provide managed detection and response uh, capability that spans email, identity, endpoint, CASB, and SIM. Uh, so hopefully the, the, the concept of, of coverage is, is clear. Uh, next, I want to bring, bring it into our methodology. So, Critical start with our MDR platform. Uh, we 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 leverage on something called ZTAP, uh, Zero Trust Analytics Platform, and that's represented in the middle of the screen here. That's that's our uh, purpose built tool uh, that our SOC analysts leverage when when we're providing MDR service uh, for a tool like MDE or MDO or Azure Sentinel, etc. Um, so basically, we're ingesting events from all of these different Microsoft security tools. Uh, into our ZTAP platform. Uh, once the security events are in ZTAP, we leverage something called the Trusted Behavior Registry uh, to resolve false positives at scale. Uh, and, and again, this is another area where I would say we're applying zero trust. Uh, we're not accepting the risk of any events, whether they're low or medium, certainly not critical or high. We're addressing all categories of alerts. 
uh, critical high, medium, and low. Uh, we all know attackers, uh, when they uh, get into a network, they're not coming in trying to set off every alarm they can, right? They're trying to fly under the radar. Uh, they're trying to use live off the land techniques and be as uh, leave as minimal a footprint as possible. So, so to, to catch the bad guys in a, in a timely manner, you, you have to be looking at every alert. Uh, and with our trusted behavior registry, we're able to do that at scale. Uh, there's quite a bit of noise that that certainly even in critical and highs, there, there's a, a number of, uh, uh, there's a lot of noise, but when you get down into mediums and lows, uh, there's quite a bit of false positives generated by these tools. Uh, the tools err on the side of over detection. Uh, so with our trusted behavior registry, we're able to ingest all the signal, uh, resolve false positive, positives at scale, and provide coverage uh, for, for all security alerts. Uh, our SOC picks up alerts uh, that come out of the, the Trusted Behavior Registry and ZTAP, uh, and they, they handle triage, investigation, and response from there. Uh, and where needed, uh, they collaborate with, with our customers uh, via something called Mobile SOC. So Mobile SOC is a, a mobile application that provides a, a full featured experience in terms of accessing ZTAP, interacting with these security alerts, interacting with our SOC, taking investigative uh, actions, taking responsive actions. Uh, so everything uh, that that's that might be needed from a, from a customer perspective is available there in the mobile SOC application. So hopefully that's a good intro to, to how we apply uh, Zero Trust in, in our MDR service. Uh, just a couple more slides to kind of to kind of close us out here and then I'll hand it over to, to Tommy to uh, Maybe walk you through a couple of examples firsthand. So, you know, when we talk about protecting uh, our our environment, uh, we have to protect all areas, right? Email, users and identities, cloud apps, endpoints, networks, our infrastructure. So, we have to have complete coverage. Uh, then we've got the six tools Microsoft offers uh, to protect those assets. MDO, MDI, Azure Active Directory, MCAS, MDE, and Azure Sentinel. And then you've got the three services critical start offers uh, to manage and operationalize those threat protection tools 24-7, 365. Uh, MDR for Microsoft 365 Defender, MDR for Defender for Endpoints, and MDR for Azure Sentinel. I'll close with you know, the critical start difference and really I'll, I'll emphasize, you know, one, one or two key pieces here. Uh, I think comprehensive integration is key. Uh, so at, at one point, uh, you know, endpoint was the focus. Uh, so rewind three years, certainly farther, and endpoint was the focus of a lot of MDRs, a lot of efforts. Uh, with Critical Start, we're able to offer that comprehensive coverage for, uh, you know, all six of the Microsoft Threat Protection Solutions uh, that, that we talked about here today. Uh, we're able to eliminate false positives at scale uh, with our with our zero trust analytics platform and, and our trusted behavior registry. That's really an important difference. And you know, 24-7, 365 coverage uh, with a one hour SLA for time to detect and mean time to respond uh, with a shift-based security operations center. So we have fresh eyes on glass every 10 hours, <clears throat> every hour of the day, every day of the year. So hopefully that was a good intro uh, and, and help to understand kind of this zero trust concept, how it can be applied uh, in kind of the detection and response uh, workflow. Uh, from here, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to hand it over to Tommy Scott. All right, thank you, Leonard. And Sean, again, thank you to you as well. So uh, my name is Tommy Scott. I know Leonard did the introduction at the beginning, but uh, I am Senior Security Consultant for Critical Start. Uh, both currently delivering everything from the pre-sales perspective as well as an actual former Critical Start MDR customer. Uh, so today I'm going to walk you through, uh, you know, how Critical Start delivers the service as well as what is the actual customer experience. Um, so since, you know, this is a, a webinar, no one can confirm. Uh, Leonard or Sean, can you all at least let me know? Can you all see the screen? Yep, looks good, Tommy. All right, perfect. So we're actually looking at two screens here. Uh, so on the left is ZTAP, the Zero Trust Analytics Platform. Yes, we put Zero Trust in the name. 
but it is the MDR platform, as Leonard mentioned, it's what we built. It is not the technology that you need to use in your environment to quote unquote secure it. It is our security wrapper around, you know, in this scenario, the, the Microsoft security stack. Defender for Endpoint, M365, the different components of a third party log set that can go into Azure Sentinel. ZTAP is how Critical Start delivers our service. It's where the SOC works out of, but it's where our customers can work out of as well. Because without customer data in this platform, it is just an empty platform. So we want to make sure in the vein of zero trust, you can verify every single thing that Critical Start is doing from an MDR perspective that ultimately affects your security posture. What's on the right, currently it is locked, but it is going to be mobile SOC. It is that mobile application Leonard mentioned that we really built for customers. We built it as a way to interact quickly with the Critical Start MDR service, as well as, as well as actually take security response, take meaningful action straight from your phone. So I'll go over that shortly, but I, I want to take this kind of from the perspective of input and output. So from an input perspective, again, we're going to harp on zero trust all day is, Let's not trust anyone, including Microsoft. Let's make sure the data getting into an MDR service is turned up as loud as possible because, you know, the noise that people are constantly trying to diminish, you know, that, that noise, it, they're data points. It's things that should be investigated. And Critical Start believes that if a tool can generate an alert, it should. And if it does, it requires investigation. So we built something that we call Threat Navigator. And specifically this window we're looking at in ZTAP, this is our IOC manager. It's where we take all the, the analytics rules that specifically for this case, Azure Sentinel, the ones they've written, and, and we validate them. So a perfect example is gonna be an actual uh, explicit MFA deny. So this IOC you can see is generated by Microsoft. This is an out of the box detection rule that they push into Sentinel. That's fantastic. We're really happy that Microsoft kind of took the initial steps to help customers fully realize the capabilities of Sentinel. However, one thing we wanted to focus on was this rule is, a, is an aggregation rule. Every time this occurs, it aggregates it into one single alert every 24 hours. And from critical start perspective, and again, zero trust, we want to see every single time that occurs. Don't wait 24 hours. Let us know in the moment. So what we've done is we've actually modified that query. We tell you how we did it, because again, this is a transparent service. You will see the value that Critical Start is providing at every turn. But we let you know we've changed the query to be significantly more robust because we want to know the, the, the second it happens. Because if a user gets an MFA push request, and kind of similar to Dustin's question, if there's MFA for everything and I'm not having them change their password, that does increase the likelihood of account compromise, meaning their password was discovered. But MFA still worked, and, and we're glad it did. But we want to know that that account is potentially compromised because the user did not request the MFA push, so they denied it. So that's an in the moment we need to investigate that, and that's Critical Start's philosophy. Look at everything, no exception, and look as quickly as possible. But to Leonard's point, Sentinel, phenomenal around the Microsoft stack, but it still has the capability to collect third-party logs. So the one that I like to uh, bring up is, you know, potential beaconing activity. Again, people are watching, so you can't type, but here you go, Palo Alto, potential beaconing activity. This is a component of the default uh, analytic rule set that, that Azure Sentinel provides. Again, we want to adjust it. Let us know every single time. Don't wait 24 hours, tell us in the moment. But we map that to MDE as well. So I'm going to pivot. I've got everything kind of staged for a nice, uh, easy flow demo. But from a Defender for Endpoint perspective, this is something where out of the box, really good detections. It's a really solid tool from an endpoint security perspective, but, but it can be made better. There's the ability to run those automated threat hunts to you know, turn up the noise, get complete unfettered visibility, because that's how you find those, those subtle TTPs that occur before the larger attack. The things that potentially indicate ransomware uh, you know, is impending. And so what Critical Start does is we inject, you know, about 67 different indications of compromise into your instance of MDE, actually utilizing the tool for detections. And we're going to take in all that telemetry for investigation and potentially response. So again, I always like to position this as, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to position it as a garbage in, garbage out. It's get as much data as possible so you can make a well-informed decision because as an MDR, 
we want to respond proactively for you. So what that actually looks like is I'm going to hop over into uh, my demo environment. Uh, this is specific to Microsoft. I've kind of got a couple different connections right now. I've got Azure Sentinel uh, Defender for Endpoint and I'm actually pulling from M365 as well. And what we're going to do is, you know, I said I want to do input output first. We just talked about input, getting the right data. Now I want to talk about output. What does the Critical Start MDR service deliver to you, the customer, and what is your experience? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to humor me and assume they know exactly what I'm about to do. They know all the buttons I'm clicking. And I'm actually going to go to a Defender for Endpoint Alert, and I'm going to assign it to myself. Now we're assuming all the analysis, all the triage has been done, and escalation is going to be delivered to you, the customer. For demonstration purposes, I'm actually going to assign that to myself. So one thing in ZTAP quickly I want to notate is everything is audited. If we go into audit logs, you'll see that I have assigned this incident to myself, and you'll see that we actually locked this incident. Zero trust doesn't mean just from a security philosophy perspective, it's trust nothing, trust no one. Don't let anybody else accidentally close this alert because that creates visibility gaps, that introduces risk into the equation. So this incident is now locked. Action must be taken by myself. I am the user who owns this alert. But what we're actually going to do is we're going to pivot over to this mobile SOC application. So we enforce multi-factor authentication. You know, as you say, MFA everything. Sean says MFA everywhere. We're 100% in agreement with that. As a security company, that's what you need to do. But of course, once you MFA in, we allow you to use Face ID for iPhone, uh, different mechanisms for Android as well. But I will unlock this and now you'll see I'm in a mobile version of ZTAP. This is a quick and easy way to do a couple different things. Get a view of how well is the service in terms of their promised delivery. Critical start, one hour contractual SLA for mean time to detect, one hour contractual SLA for mean time to respond for every alert priority, no exception. Criticals, highs, mediums, and lows, they will be investigated and responded to at those one hour SLAs. But from MobileSoc, you get an idea of, okay, from an alert triage perspective, what am I currently looking at? We support multi-tenancy, so we can say how many alerts are open for this organization versus a child organization, which ones are criticals and highs, how many are currently assigned to you, as well as just giving you that breakdown of here's alerts by priority. But then we want to, we really want to touch on the value of the service before human analysts need to get involved. So you're going to be able to see what is the actual efficiency of Critical Start MDR? So here you see event reduction rate. Security events, again, we want to collect as much telemetry as possible, as much data to indicate you know, what's actually happening in your environment. But what we've done is, as Leonard mentioned, we built something called the Trusted Behavior Registry, which is that orchestration component to automatically resolve alerts if you can definitively say they're known good. And we'll touch on how to build those playbooks, how that works from an implementations process, how it's, a, it's an ever learning service. This isn't a point in time value and going forward it's diminishing. It's let's continue to resolve alerts with playbooks we can create when we have enough information to definitively say something is good. And so that typically uh, arrives at about a 99.9% .9 resolution rate. And that's where our SOC gets to start. With that less than 1%, that's where the human analysts come in to to apply context. Again, it's not that the alert occurred, we care why it occurred. But what we've done as Critical Start is, is we've tailored our service to you because each organization is different. So we wanna focus on what does your organization need under certain circumstances? So we will respond under two, two different scenarios. One, the tools we're monitoring give us the ability to respond. And two, your rules of engagement allow us to respond. So the example that I'm going to use is this, the device that is currently affected via a Defender for Endpoint Alert is a production server. That is critical to the business, critical start, even though we can isolate, we are told explicitly not to. And so what we're going to see here, you see assigned to me is 14. Uh, if I actually refresh this, it's going to change to 15. So I do have push notifications suppressed. Obviously, we are doing a live demo, but you would get a push notification on mobile SOC. There's also the ability for a phone call, text message, email, ZTAP notification. If we need to get a hold of you, we absolutely will. But what we want to do is focus on what can you do when you told us not to respond? So I'm going to go into this alert and you're going to see I'm going to have access to the same alert I can see in ZTAP. So 45835, 45835. I'm going to go into that alert. 
And let's pretend now I'm I'm a member of one of your organizations. I'm the new guy, so of course I'm on call. I want to know why am I being woken up at 2 a.m. I'm going to be able to see exactly what the SOC escalated. And it's always going to have four bits of information out of the box by default. Contextual priority. Again, it's not that the alert occurred, it's why. What does it actually mean? And, and we're going to tell you that. What did we see? We're going to translate that to risk. Why do we care? And finally, what's a recommended next step? So for the purposes of example, we wanted to isolate for you. We had the ability to do so. Straight from ZTAP, we can request full host isolation, utilizing the capabilities already inside of Defender for Endpoint. This isn't an additional technology or agent you have to deploy. It is us utilizing the API connectivity to your tools to deliver a complete service. But if you told us do not respond, that's what we've given you the ability to do in mobile SOC. You're going to be able to go into the actual events themselves. You're going to be able to see all the information the Defender afforded you, which this is good, but just being honest, this is syslog. And syslog is a very binary set of information. Everything that's contained there is what you have to make a decision from. And that specifically is why we are API connected to your tools versus just asking you to send a syslog. Because we want to ask more questions, but we also want to give you the ability to do the same. So you'll notice these little blue bubbles. We call these threat analysis plugins. It's representative of our API connectivity. So I'm going to go up here to this, this little blue bubble. And if I am a member of your organization, Critical Start has recommended that I isolate the host. You know, I'm going to trust their judgment, but I want to make sure, you know, who's actually on that machine. It's 2 a.m. I can see that this user is interactively logged on, and that's really good information to have because what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to go right here to response, and I can take that full host isolation action straight from my phone. And the reason why it's good to know that person was interactively logged on is because I just kicked them off. And so that's going to be something where, again, I can notify them, I can send them an email, I can escalate them this specific issue from my phone. It's all going to be handled within this one single application. But that is mobile SOC. That is what we built for customers. You are not required to use it either. You can be in ZTAB, but it is a way to enable your technology from a mobile phone. So taking meaningful action, you know, through Azure Sentinel, disabling a user, you know, if you in fact do have passwords set to never expire, but that account is compromised, maybe you want to have that user reset their password. You're going to be able to take those actions from your phone utilizing mobile SOC. But for purposes of demonstration, I'm actually going to expand this, give myself a little more screen real estate. So we just went over uh, Defender for Endpoint example. We talked about input with IOC Manager. This one was for Sentinel. I'm going to close these out. This one was for Defender. But what I've actually done is I've loaded up a scenario that Sean specifically mentioned, and I uh, ironically was guilty of it. So username, Tommy Scott, that's me. I was active in the United Kingdom and the United States within 13 minutes. So typically either two things are responsible for this. One, VPN utilization, or two, I, I magically turned into Superman. The second one is less likely. So in fact, what I was doing, I was utilizing a VPN to get around some geographic constrictions and I wanted to watch something on YouTube. Was that necessarily the best thing to do from a security perspective? Absolutely not. But was it an actual false positive? Yes. However, our analysts didn't know what I was doing just by looking at this alert. The alert from NCAS is helpful. We know that this is, in fact, impossible travel activity, but what actually indicates it is a false positive or it's something that we don't need to you know raise the alarm bells for so getting this information through sentinel is good but utilizing the m365 stack is better so we're going to hook directly into the microsoft graph to touch the different components of the e5 security stack and so of course leonard and sean know much more than me about microsoft but i'll, I'll talk through kind of the investigation process and actually before i do that I want to make sure that again, you know, this is a zero trust webinar, but I want to focus on, you know, zero trust means make sure at every given opportunity, Critical Start is telling our analysts exactly what we expect of them and what the customer expects as well. So we built something called event hints. This lets them know what are their expectations for this type of alert. Why do we care about that alert? Again, what could it potentially indicate? 
how should they perform that investigation? Now, Critical Start puts a tremendous amount of time into training somewhere in the neighborhood of about 320 hours before analysts are allowed to touch a customer alert. But even though we trust their training and we have phenomenal employee retention in our SOC, we want them to know at every given opportunity, here's exactly what's expected of you. So what do you need to go look for? How do you perform this investigation to be able to determine what is potentially indicative of a, of a false positive? And also, what are some potential remediation and mitigation steps that can be performed? So again, just leveling the playing field, making sure there's consistent deliverable value to you, the customer. So one of those recommendations was go into the user account and say, pull recent sign-ins. You know, go to Azure AD sign-in logs, get me sign-ins for the last four hours before the event and two hours after the event occurred. So this is rather robust. So 275 uh, instances of, of my account signing in. Now, this is a tremendously large table of information. So what we've done is we've built something called event analysis. This is looking for entropy. How frequently or equally important, how infrequently do you see key value pairs in that subset of data? So we talked about conditional access. Well, it was not applied. So already I'm a little more suspicious that this could potentially indicate something malicious. However, if I go to additional details, I'll see MFA actually was satisfied. It wasn't enforced as a part of the, the access path that I was doing, but I was satisfying MFA and how I was accessing the environment. So already I'm, I'm de-escalating. This isn't a critical alert. This is something that maybe we just want to figure out what was Tommy doing? How was this possible? But then we get more information. We see all the cities he accessed. We see the different states, the different countries. So we now know this in fact was only located to United Kingdom in the US. Then we keep going down. Okay, what user agents was he accessing? Okay, well, it was Outlook, it was Word. He was accessing OneDrive. He was using multiple different uh, web browsers. Now, just to be honest, what I was doing, I was working on an RFP. So of course I was accessing OneDrive. I was accessing a bunch of different information. I was compiling it in Microsoft Word. We're getting an idea of, of what I was doing, but we wanna confirm that as well. So straight from here, I'm gonna be able to say, pull all O365 activity. So I'm going to flash it up on the screen quickly just because I don't want to potentially expose any data that could be sensitive, but you're going to be able to see that I can see every bit of information that I was currently doing inside of O365 uh, itself. And so that's the blast radius that Sean mentioned. It's not that I care about this one alert, it's I care about what was actually happening. And so that's where we're going to be able to say what was that user doing, but also what was happening simultaneously from these different um, you know, different components. So if I want to say get recent sign-ins by IP, I now can say show me other sign-ins by this IP that was associated to this alert. And so again, blast radius. Now I see, all right, there were 14 other instances, but you can see user principal name, it was all going to be me. And so from the user principal name perspective, you can see it was just Tommy. So now we know it's not an external attacker from a single IP attempting to uh, penetrate into the network using multiple accounts. And so again, just understanding how to use the full breadth of the Microsoft stack to make strategic decisions on what actually is known good. And finally, what it's going to result in is, is how can we continue to make the service better? You know, we say we have this trusted behavior registry of, you know, 40 plus thousand playbooks. It's going to get a 99% resolution rate. That is asking a lot of you to trust that, trust us that that's working as we say. So again, we want to expose that to you. We want to show you every playbook that's applied, what key value pairs are included, uh, who created the playbook, who deployed the playbook, complete transparency. And so I'm actually going to pick on that uh, Defender for Endpoint Alert again. And we're going to walk through what a playbook creation looks like. So we're going to pick that uh, user account activity via command line. So key thing to notice, this has a prefix of CS1. This is one of those custom indications of compromise we push into your tools to fully operationalize them, make them more effective, give us complete visibility. Again, at no extra cost to you. This is just maximizing the investment you've already made. But what we want to focus on is if we know an alert is actually a false positive, do we know why and can we definitively say so? So what we're going to do is we're going to be able to add to that trusted behavior registry. So this is 100% not application whitelisting because we're using real context, behavior-based key value pairs to indicate why it's known good. So we can start to say, you know, if this host name, this user is running net.exe, 
That's application whitelisting, extremely ineffective. The second an account is compromised, everything downstream is invisible to you, the customer, and the third party provider. So we want to say, you know, this is the path it's running from. It's got a known good hash. This was the parent uh, command line with the parent file name. That's the path. This was the exact command line being run. And we can keep going down, getting more and more granular. You know, it had to start from this grandparent. But while this is pretty granular, because of our API connectivity, we can get more information. So this is where we can use those threat analysis plugins. And we can say, okay, with logged on users, we know the log on type is interactive. And that matters to us. If this activity has occurred, we want it to be somebody who's actually on the box. So we can add that API call into the playbook. So we say, logged on users, it was log on types, matches, and again, everyone's watching, so I can't type, matches interactive. So now what our process is doing is saying, conditionally, if all of these key value pairs match, it might be good, but go run this API call to confirm. Run this, get logged on users, which is not contained entirely in this syslog event. Pull more data to make a better, more well-informed decision. And at that point, if all matches, now we can definitively say it's good. And if the future, there's a single digit or character that is different in one of these key value pairs, that is a new alert. It is something we've never seen before. And as far as we're concerned, it's a threat and it will be responded to at the one hour SLAs. And just to round out, you know, the zero trust uh, kind of overarching theme, this process, you know, ZTAP, you as the customer are gonna have complete visibility and access to it. You can click every button we can click, you can see every screen, we can. This is the only platform by which we deliver our service. So complete uh, auditability and ownership of your actual security posture via Critical Start MDR. But there is one thing that nobody can do unilaterally, and that is create and deploy a playbook. So we built one thing, validation. How effective is this playbook? If I expected this playbook to only resolve one alert, and now I see it's resolving 358, two things happened. Either A, we recognized an economy of scale, which is extremely common, or B, we were not granular enough. So this is why we enforce two-person integrity because the one thing that nobody can do unilaterally is create and deploy that playbook. When I click save, it goes into an approval queue and a minimum of an L2 analyst at critical start or higher will perform the same investigation, run the validation, and if everything checks out, we're only resolving what we can definitively say is good. At that point, the playbook is deployed and you have complete visibility into that in terms of who created it, who reviewed it, and who approved it. So, Michael, I'll turn it back to you if you want to MC the rest of this or, or Sean, Leonard, wh wh whichever one. But from a demonstration perspective, that's the, the key salient points I wanted to cover. And then now we can open it up for Q&A. I see we've got a cup or at least one question, Sean, if we want to address that to the larger group. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Tommy. Let me uh, yeah. get my get slide, slide deck back, back, up, back here. up here. So we did have a question in uh, in the Q and A regarding password policy, and um, you know, Tommy, I know you touched on this as well as you know Microsoft's recommendation and a lot of their documentation is to never expire passwords anymore. And is this is this safe? Do we recommend this? And um, unfortunately, I, I hate to say this, but my answer has to be it depends um, because there are some tools that I would recommend being in place in order to to do that. A couple of them being, um, do you have a consistent identity management platform like Azure AD uh, where you're using and leveraging to log into a lot of your applications? The second one being is, um, are you blocking known bad passwords? You know, uh, fall 2021 exclamation point, might meet your length and uh, complexity requirements of your password policy, but it's not a great password. So there's tools in place that we can use to make sure a lot of those passwords are blocked, uh, such as Azure AD password protection. And then the third being, um, 
you know, monitoring those logins uh, for consistent and anom uh, consistent logins and or anomalous logins. And so if a user uh, is logging in from Europe 13 minutes later, do we want to block that login? Do we want to alert someone uh, that that's happening? And obviously those alerts could go into the critical start ZTAP platform then be responded to uh, that way. Um, so, you know, a lot of those things, uh, if those are in place, yes, absolutely. Uh, never expiring passwords is an absolute reality and does does help against what we call password fatigue, where uh, users can just either, you know, every 30 or 90 days when they're asked to change their password, they can add a number to it or make something simple because, uh, you know, every time they reset their password, they forget it. So they tend to make easy passwords. Um, so that can definitely uh, uh, be implemented. And of course, we can't figure about, figure, uh, forget about some organizations just are regulated by specific organizations that don't share the same guidance as Microsoft does. And, you know, while there's some debate there between who's right, you know, is Microsoft right? Is the regulatory organization right? Um, you really kind of have to analyze it best and what works best for your organization and your requirements. Um, so with that, um, if we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, we can wrap it up here. Um, we just want to call out that, you know, as you're investigating your zero trust journey and, you know, we gave some tips and tricks on how to get started and some tools to help you down that path, but we would be absolutely be um, happy to continue the conversation down your zero trust journey to talk about an assessment of your current current progress and how you can continue moving it forward. Um, there's a link there, help.apexdigital.com slash zero trust, where you can get more information and schedule an assessment um, to get started on this journey. So with that, I thank everyone for your time today and have a great day.